Why do we have leap years? Calendars are fairly fixed things, each year has the same number of months and days. And the days follow a seven-day rotation going from Sunday to Saturday. But the movements of Earth do not conform exactly to the time designations humans have imposed. For example, the calendar used in much of the world, the Gregorian calendar, says that a year has 365 days. In fact, it takes Earth about 365.25 days to go around the Sun. That extra one quarter day must be accounted for in the calendar or eventually, the calendar and the seasons of the year would no longer be aligned. To correct this problem, an extra day is added to the calendar every four years. In such years, called leap years, February has one extra day, or 29 days. When the Gregorian calendar was devised, astronomers realized that even adjusting the calendar to add one day every four years would still not make it match exactly the movements of Earth. So they decreed that when that fourth year falls in a century year, one with two zeros at the end. That is not divisible by 400, like 1700 or 1900, there would not be an extra day. Which animal is the fastest? The cheetah clocked at speeds of 70 miles, 112 kilometers, per hour is the fastest animal on land. Cheetah's bodies, with their small heads, long legs, and ridged foot pads that give them extra traction, are designed especially for speed. Humans, by the way have been known to travel short distances as fast as 28 miles 45 kilometers per hour. Measuring speed in sea animals is very difficult, but studies have shown that the sailfish is the fastest creature in the sea. Swimming at speeds up to 68 miles 109 kilometers per hour. The fastest animal in the air is the peregrine falcon. When flying horizontally, the peregrine falcon can go around 60 miles, 97 kilometers, per hour. It is during its high-speed dives for prey that this bird breaks speed records, however. Flying at a speed of more than 200 miles, 322 kilometers, Per hour. The peregrine falcon frequently kills its prey just by the force of impact. Why do flamingos' knees bend the other way? If you've seen flamingos, and some other long-legged birds, like cranes, you've probably noticed that. When they walk, their legs bend in the opposite direction of human legs. How do mountains and valleys form? A mountain is an area of high ground that rises 1,000 feet, 305 meters, or more above its surroundings. 
A group of mountains is called a mountain range. Almost all mountains and valleys the depressions between separate mountains or mountain peaks are formed when the huge moving plates of rock that make up Earth's crust collide with one another, which forces their edges to break and rise and fold, eventually creating a rising land mass. The process is a slow one, though, taking place over millions of years. It is also continuous, with new mountains being formed all the time. The age of a mountain can often be determined by its size and shape. Newer mountains are high and jagged, while older ones which have been eroded or worn down by wind and weather over millions of years are smoother and lower. The movement of rivers or glaciers, large masses of ice on land. Through mountains can also create valleys by slowly wearing rock away. How did the days of the week get their names? In the English language, some of the days of the week take their names from the celestial bodies that, according to ancient beliefs, ruled that day. So the day ruled by the sun became Sunday, the day ruled by the moon became Monday. And the day ruled by the planet Saturn became Saturday. The remaining days of the week take their names from figures in Anglo-Saxon or Norse mythology. Tuesday is named for the Anglo-Saxon god of war, Tiu, which is Mars in Roman mythology. Wednesday is named for Woden, the Anglo-Saxon name for the chief Norse god Odin. Thursday gets its name from Thor, the god of thunder in Norse mythology. Friday is named either after Freya, the Norse goddess of love and fertility, or Frigg, the wife of Odin and the representative of beauty and love. How many different languages are there? There are more than 4,000 languages spoken in the world today. In some large countries, several languages are spoken. India has more than 800. In other large countries, different versions or dialects of the same language are spoken in different areas. In both cases, an official language is usually chosen for the country. That language is used in schools, by the mass media, like television, and by the government. Many languages have no written form. Tribal languages like some spoken in Africa and Australia, for example, have been passed on orally, by word of mouth. Such unrecorded native languages often disappear when their speakers learn and use the official languages of the countries in which they live. In fact, one reason that languages like Spanish and English are spoken in so many different parts of the world is because people who spoke them conquered and colonized many foreign lands. Replacing native cultures and languages with their own. For a long time people have been trying to invent a world language that everyone can speak and understand. Attempting to remove the barriers that different languages create. 
The best known of these is Esperanto, invented by a Polish man named Ludwig L. Zamenhof in the late 19th century. This and other international languages have not been very successful. Universal pictures, signs and symbols have actually been the most effective way of communicating worldwide. Another way to break the language barrier is to study a second language like French or Spanish. Many people in the world know at least two languages very well. Such people are considered bilingual, or multilingual if they know more than two languages. How is a seal different from a sea lion? Sea lions are just one of many different types of seals. Seals, along with walruses, are classified as pinnipeds, a Latin word meaning fin footed. As the name suggests, Seals' limbs are flippers, they have one pair in front, and one pair in back. Seals are divided into two categories, earless, or true, seals, which have tiny ear holes but no external flaps. And eared seals, so named because they have small ear flaps on their heads. Earless seals include the gray seal, harp seal, and the huge elephant seal, which can reach a length of 21 feet, 6.5 meters, and weigh 7,780 pounds, 3,530 kilograms. Sea lions and fur seals are eared seals. There are several differences, in addition to the ears, between sea lions and their earless seal relatives. The sea lion's flippers are longer than those of earless seals. They look like wings and usually don't have hair on them, while seals' flippers are covered with hair. Sea lions can turn their hind flippers forward, allowing them to use all of their limbs when moving on land. Seals cannot turn their hind flippers forward, and in order to move on land they slide on their bellies and pull with their front flippers, moving in much the same way as a caterpillar. What is a tornado? A tornado is a dark, funnel-shaped column of violently twisting air that extends down from a cumulonimbus, or thunderstorm, cloud. It is usually accompanied by thunder, lightning, and heavy rain. Unlike ocean-generated tropical storms and hurricanes, tornadoes begin over land and occur when low, moist. Warm winds blowing in one direction meet cooler, higher, drier winds blowing in a different direction. The rotating winds of a tornado can reach up to 300 miles, 483 kilometers per hour, and if it extends close enough to Earth it can destroy anything in its path. While most tornadoes only travel along the ground for a few minutes and a few miles. Leaving narrow paths of destruction, others have been known to last for hours. Touching down many times and leaving behind hundreds of miles of damage. Despite their small size and short duration. Tornadoes do more complete damage than any other kind of weather disaster.
What is a booger? The mucous membrane that lines your nose is moist and sticky. That environment helps trap dust and other things in the air before they can pass into your lungs. When moisture evaporates from the thick film of mucus that covers the lining of your nose which happens all the time as air passes over it the mucus. Combining with the particles you've breathed in, becomes dried and crusty, forming boogers. Can people who die see and talk with living people after they are gone? Although for centuries living people have reported seeing and talking to people who have died. There is no scientific proof that this can be done or that visiting with ghosts is possible. Although some people claim they have special skills allowing them to contact and receive messages from the deceased. Such people are known as spiritualist mediums. Their communications usually conducted during meetings called seances have generally proven to be fake. Sometimes, though, people who have recently had a loved one die feel that they can sense that person's presence with them, they may even talk to the deceased. It is likely that these sensations arise out of very Powerful feelings of loss and vivid memories of the loved one. For many people, believing that a physical connection continues after death lessens their sorrow. It is one of many ways through which people keep alive the memories of those who have died. Why do I feel thirsty? When your body is low on water, or dehydrated, the moist lining of your mouth and throat become dry. Thirst sensors there send a message to your brain, which tells you to drink at once. About three-fourths of the human body is made of fluids. And the average adult must take in about two and one-half quarts, about two and one-half liters, of water and other healthy beverages, like fruit juice, every day to remain healthy. Though some of the fluids we need also come from solid foods, which contain large amounts of water. Sometimes you may feel thirsty even when your body isn't dehydrated, things like dry. Dusty air or salty food can draw moisture from your mouth and throat, alerting your thirst sensors. To demonstrate this, try swallowing dry crackers without taking a drink. What happens to old money? Hen money gets damaged or dirty or wears out. Commercial banks send the bills to one of the Federal Reserve Banks in exchange for new bills. If the Reserve Bank determines that the currency is unfit for circulation, it is destroyed. Damaged coins are returned to the Treasury. While the paper used for currency is more durable than regular paper. It is still fairly delicate and can't stay in circulation very long before getting worn out. Different bills have different lifespans, 
smaller bills get handled more and therefore wear out sooner. A $1 bill, for example, usually lasts around 18 months. While a $20 bill can be in circulation for 2 years and a $100 bill for 8 and a half years. A coin, naturally, lasts longer usually around 25 years. It isn't just Federal Reserve Banks that can provide new bills in exchange for old ones. Anybody who has money that is torn or damaged can take it to a local bank and get a new bill. As long as more than half of the original bill is intact. A bank should be able to provide a new bill of the same value. What causes a yawn? When you are bored or tired you sometimes give a big yawn. Yawning happens because you are not breathing deeply enough. Oxygen, the gas needed to run body processes, and carbon dioxide, the waste gas produced by these processes. Travel in your bloodstream and enter and exit your body through your lungs. When you don't breathe deeply enough, too much carbon dioxide builds up in your body and your brain gets the message. Telling you to breathe more deeply to fix the problem. A yawn is a great big breath that clears carbon dioxide from your lungs and forces you to take in fresh, oxygen-rich air. Sometimes a series of yawns is required. Scientists don't know why yawning seems to be contagious. But it usually is, when one person yawns, others often start yawning, too. Why do I get dizzy when I turn around in circles? The inner ear, also known as the labyrinth because it resembles a maze, is made of three fluid-filled tubes bent in half circles. As you move your head, the liquid in these tubes moves, too. Stirring tiny hair cells inside that send messages to your brain, telling it what you are doing. The brain takes this information, along with messages from your eyes and the muscles of your body. And tells you what movements you need to make to keep your balance. When you spin around quickly, the fluid in these tubes moves too fast and your brain gets more messages than it can process at one time. You may get dizzy, lose your balance, and even fall down before your brain catches up, making you steady again. What does it mean if an animal is an endangered species? There are many organizations in the United States and all over the world that study and research plant and animal species. Determining which ones may be headed for extinction. Any species in such danger is described as endangered. Once a species is endangered, it becomes illegal to hunt that animal or destroy its habitat. In 2001 the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the organization that maintains the nation's 
list of endangered and threatened plants and animals, listed over 1,000 animals and nearly 750 plants worldwide. Threatened species are those that might soon become endangered. The goal of such organizations is to help a species recover to the point that it no longer needs to be listed as endangered. Why don't some kernels pop? Such duds probably don't have enough water inside to pop them. Why did soldiers once wear armor? Since ancient times, soldiers have worn special clothing or armor to protect themselves during warfare. Hard materials like leather, wood, shells, and even woven reeds were used to give soldiers extra protection against enemy arrows. Metal started to be used for armor about 3,500 years ago, by warriors in the Middle East by the time of the ancient Greeks. About 1000 years later, soldiers were well protected. Wearing large pieces of metal on their chests and backs, shin guards and metal helmets, and they carried metal shields. Soon armored clothing, garments with metal strips and plates attached, began to be made for soldiers. Then chain mail, a type of metal cloth, was developed. Made of small metal rings linked together, chain mail was much more flexible than metal plates. But could not withstand the force of larger weapons, like lances. So full suits of armor made of steel plates. Hinged at the knees and the elbows, came into use around the 14th century. Soldiers were covered with steel from head to toe. With heavy metal helmets covering their faces, heads, and necks. A warrior could see and breathe through small slits or openings in the helmet's visor. A movable metal flap that could be lifted up. Only important or wealthy warriors could afford this kind of elaborate armor. Suits of armor weighed so much that the soldiers or knights who wore them usually couldn't move around in them very well. They wore such armor mostly when they fought on horseback. Even the horses sometimes wore armor. As the methods and weapons of warfare changed, Clumsy personal armor was no longer useful. It became far more important for soldiers to be able to move quickly and easily. Today's soldiers usually wear cloth uniforms and steel helmets. But armor is used on war vehicles like tanks, naval vessels, and aircraft. The bulletproof vests that police officers use are also a type of armor. What causes earthquakes? An earthquake is a great shaking of Earth's surface. It is caused by the cracking and shifting of the plates of rock that make up the planet's layered crust. As shifting plates suddenly slide past one another, vibrations in the form of waves are released. 
These shock waves travel through Earth, gradually weakening as they move farther from the spot. Or spots, where the quake began, which is called the epicenter. Regions located near faults, places where cracks in Earth's crust are known to exist. Are particularly vulnerable to earthquakes. Earthquakes vary in size and intensity. They may last a few seconds or continue for a few minutes. They may cause no damage. Or they could result in widespread destruction and the deaths of thousands of people. Earthquake vibrations can be so violent that they collapse bridges and buildings, destroy highways. Cause landslides, and lead to flooding if they occur in shallow water near a coast. When they occur under the ocean. Earthquakes can cause a giant wave called a tsunami, which can reach heights of more than 100 feet. What should I do if someone asks for my name when I'm online? The internet is an amazing place where you can find information on all kinds of things. You can chat with friends, email long distance pen pals, and read what other people are saying about things you're interested in. But just as you shouldn't talk to strangers when in the outside world, you should also use caution when chatting in the cyber world. Unfortunately, there are people surfing the web who present a threat to kids. They may be adults posing as another kid or somehow lying to you about who they are and what they want. To be safe, never give anyone you don't know personal information. About yourself online including your name, address, or phone number. And never agree to meet a person you've chatted with online. Even if that person seems friendly and harmless. Let your parents know if a stranger is sending you email or instant messages. It's also important to ask your parents first before registering at a website. Many sites offer special benefits if you register as a member, which involves providing your name, email address, and sometimes home address, phone number, and other information. While some sites protect your privacy and only use that information to send you things you want, others sell your information to advertisers or organizations. As a result of registering at a website, your family may end up getting lots of unwanted email. Regular mail, and phone calls from companies trying to sell you things. And even if you find a great deal online for something you really want. Never give out your parents' credit card information unless they say it's okay. Why are animals sometimes kept in cages at zoos? For many decades, most zoo animals were exhibited in cages with bars. It was a way to allow zoo visitors a good view of the animals while keeping people safe from unexpected attacks. Cages also kept animals in small areas, which was economical saving the zoo money and they were made of hard materials that could be hosed down, making them easy to keep clean. 
While cages are still used at zoos today, it is not often that an animal is kept in one all the time. Zoologists now realize that it is unhealthy and even cruel for an animal to always be confined to a cage where it cannot get the exercise it would ordinarily get in the wild. In recent years, many zoos have built large enclosures for zoo animals that resemble the creature's own natural habitats. While zoo visitors may not be able to look as closely at an animal in such enclosures where a creature can hide in caves or trees the accommodations are much better for the animal which can now exhibit more natural behavior. How do snakes move without legs? Snakes have no arms or legs, yet they can move fairly swiftly through grass, sand, and, in some cases, water, and they can easily climb trees. Snakes can achieve such amazing mobility thanks to well-developed muscles and a row of scales. Called ventral scales, on the undersides of their bodies. They usually rely on the ground's rough surface to provide resistance. Something for them to push against that isn't slippery. Most snakes move by coiling their bodies into a series of S-shaped loops. With each loop pushing against the ground. Some large snakes, like boas, move in a way similar to a caterpillar, inching along the ground. Snakes that live in the desert have a harder time getting the traction necessary for movement. These snakes, called sidewinders, move in a sideways motion that allows them to slither along on the ever-shifting sandy surface. While the absence of limbs might seem like a handicap, Snakes have certain advantages thanks to their unique bodies. Not only can they move quickly and easily over and through a variety of landscapes. They can also move in near silence, making it easy for them to sneak up on their prey. And their narrow, flexible bodies allow them to fit into small crevices and holes where they can wait for unsuspecting animals to come along, or where they can hide from predators. What is the world's highest waterfall? It isn't easy to measure the height of waterfalls because they usually descend in a series of falls instead of in one big drop. The world's highest waterfall, Angel Falls, named after the man who discovered it, is located in Venezuela, on the Carao River. It has the largest single drop of any waterfall at 2,648 feet, 807 meters. The total height of Angel Falls is 3,212 feet, 979 meters. You can see North America's highest waterfall, Yosemite Falls, 2,425 feet, or 739 meters, when you visit Yosemite National Park in California. How are books made?
Once a book has been written and edited, it must be typeset, printed, and bound and today those tasks are performed mostly by machines. The typesetter follows the instructions of the book designer, taking a regular looking electronic document. Like something you might create on a home computer for a school report. And formatting it so it looks like a book page with type in all different sizes and styles. After the book has been proofrechecked checked for mistakes the typesetter either. Prints out the pages onto a special kind of paper that can be photographed or Creates a special computer file containing the whole book, including pictures. The second method, called electronic prepress. Eliminates several steps for the printer and has become far more common in recent years. Regardless of the method used for delivering the book to the printer. Whether on camera ready paper or a computer disc, the printer must create several large negatives. Like the ones you get back with your pictures when you've had film developed at the drugstore. Each negative contains several pages of the book. These negative sheets, called flats, are placed over a thin metal plate that is sensitive to light. Like the paper that photographs are printed on. When exposed to light, the images from the negatives the words and pictures of the book appear on the metal plate. Which is now ready to accept ink and print the pages of the book. The metal plate is loaded onto large cylinders, tubes, and covered with ink. Which only sticks to the parts of the plates that have the letters and images. Then large sheets of paper are rolled through the cylinders, which press the ink onto the paper. Once the ink has dried, machines fold the sheets of paper many times over. Pinching, pulling, and creasing them. Each large sheet, once it's been folded up by the machine, forms a section of the book. Called a signature, and all the sections of the book are then put together and readied for binding. The final step of making a book involves either gluing or sewing all the signatures together. Attaching the cover, and trimming the pages so all the book's edges are perfectly even. The book is now ready to be shipped to a bookstore or library where it can be read and enjoyed. What is heaven? According to many religions based on Judaism and Christianity, heaven is a state of existence where a person's spirit is at last united with God forever. In a number of Christian religions, Heaven is believed to be the reward for people who have lived good lives according to certain rules of thought and behavior that God has made known through scriptures. Sacred writings, like the Bible, and through the teachings of churches and religious leaders. Those who have not followed these rules, it is believed by many. Go to a place of punishment known as hell. Many Christians believe that at the end of the world their human forms will be resurrected in a perfect state just as the body of Jesus Christ was. When he arose from the dead on Easter morning and joined their souls or spirits in heaven for eternity. This idea has led to the concept that heaven is an Actual place located above with physical characteristics. 
Over the centuries, through pictures and writings, people have tried to create images of heaven. Imagining a place of perfect happiness perched atop fluffy white clouds. It has often been portrayed as a place full of things that would bring happiness on earth. Possessing, for instance, pearly gates and streets of gold. Are there any poisonous lizards? Two lizards are known to inject venom into their prey, the Gila, pronounced he -h. Monster and the Mexican beaded lizard. The Gila, found in northern Mexico and the southwestern United States. Produces venom that is secreted into grooves in their teeth. When they bite into their prey, the venom gets into the other animal's blood. Around 20 inches, 50 centimeters, long, Gila monsters eat small mammals and birds as well as eggs. They have been known to bite people, but while their bites may be painful, they rarely cause serious harm to humans. The Mexican beaded lizard, a close relative to the Gila, can be a bit larger around 31 inches, or 80 centimeters. It lives throughout much of Mexico and parts of Central America. Both of these lizards, during seasons when food is hard to find, can live for months off fat stored in their tails. Where does our electricity come from? All matter is made of tiny particles called atoms. Inside an atom are even tinier particles. Electrons that move in orbit around a center, or nucleus, made of neutrons and protons. An electron has a negative electric charge and a proton has a positive one. Usually an atom has the same number of each, which keeps the atom neutral or unchanged argued. But sometimes electrons leave their orbit. Attracted to other atoms that lack an electron and are positively charged. The movement or flow of electrons from one atom to another produces the form of energy called electricity. The electricity we use is made by huge machines, or generators, in places called power plants. An energy source is needed to run the generators, heat from burning coal, oil, or natural gas, or from the fission of nuclear fuel is used to boil water for the steam required to turn the turbines, or giant blades, that start the generators. Heat-based energy is known as thermal power. Rushing water from giant man-made dams or waterfalls, hydropower, can also do the job. Although not widely used, the force of the wind and the heat of the sun can be used to power generators to make electricity, too. With the help of a giant magnet, a generator creates a flow of electric charges. Or an electric current, that runs through copper wire. But in order for this electricity to travel great distances, to homes and businesses far away. Its voltage the force that pushes a current along must be raised. To accomplish this, 
the electricity passes through a device called a transformer. Travel ready but now too powerful and dangerous to use. Electricity is sent out from a power plant through huge cables that need to be buried. Safely underground or stretched high in the air between tall support towers. When the electricity reaches its destination. It is run through another transformer that reduces its voltage so that it is again suitable for normal use. It then travels to homes and businesses, through large wires attached to meters that show how much. Electricity is used at each location, so that the power company that runs the plant can be paid for it. Smaller wires run through the floors and walls of a home bringing electricity to every room. These wires are attached to safety devices called fuses or circuit breakers, which stop the flow of electric current if for any reason, it should rise to dangerous levels, which may cause overheating and fire. Devices that are powered by electricity, like lights, televisions, and toasters, can be connected with the current running through a home by the flip of a switch or by being plugged into outlets or sockets. Why do we have different time zones throughout the world? At one time, every region of the world had its own system for measuring time. Traveling from one locality to another could be very confusing. Adding to the confusion is the fact that, even if every place measured time in the same way with each day being 24 hours, each hour being 60 minutes, etc. The fact that Earth is constantly Rotating means that when it's midday in Chicago, Illinois, it's early evening in London, England. The rotation of the planet means that we can't have just one time zone for the whole world. If that were the case, then noon would be the middle of the day in some places. The evening in other places, and the middle of the night somewhere else. In some places, the sun would go down at 7 p.m. But that same hour thousands of miles to the east would be the time the sun was rising. In the late 1800s participants at an international conference figured out a way to divide the world into different time zones to account for Earth's movements. In one day, Earth makes one rotation on its axis. It moves 15 degrees every hour, so after 24 hours it has come full circle, or 360 degrees. Scientists therefore decided to divide the planet into 24 sections of 15 degrees each. They used the imaginary longitudinal lines, called meridians, that run between the North and South Poles. The starting point is a place called Greenwich, a London suburb. The line running through Greenwich is called the Prime Meridian. Every 15 degrees to the west of Greenwich is another hour earlier than what is known as Greenwich Mean Time. Or GMT and every 15 degrees to the east is another hour later. So if it is noon in Greenwich, in one time zone to the west it is 11 a.m. And in one time zone to the east it is 1 p.m. While the longitudinal lines are straight and fixed. The lines dividing actual time zones have been changed a bit to accommodate the people who live there.
What is hydroponics? Hydroponics is a method of growing plants in nutrient-rich water instead of soil. People have grown plants using hydroponics for about 50 years. This method is useful in places that have poor soil or for producing special plants for research. Growing conditions can be more closely controlled with hydroponics than out in the field. Crops are not bothered by weeds or insects in their protected, watery environments. And their water and mineral needs are perfectly met in the large tanks in which they grow. Without soil, plants can also be grown closer together. One problem with hydroponics, though, is that plants often have trouble supporting themselves when their roots aren't in soil, which can keep them from reaching full growth. Sometimes the roots of hydroponic plants are put in sand or gravel to fix the problem. Or the plants are supported by wires. In the future, if people live in space stations or on other planets they will need to use hydroponics to raise food and to recycle carbon dioxide and oxygen. When I cut or scrape myself, why do I get a scab? When you get a cut or a scratch, you break blood vessels in, and sometimes below, your skin. Blood begins to leak out of them then, and platelets small ovals of special. Matter in the blood start to gather and stick together at the area of broken skin. Special chemicals also cause blood to thicken there. Forming webs that trap blood cells and keep them from escaping. As more blood cells are trapped, a clot forms. As it hardens, it becomes a scab. A shield that keeps outside germs from entering the damaged skin. Beneath the scab, the body can repair the tissues. The scab shrinks over time as the skin around it heals, and it falls off when all repair work is done. How does a light bulb work? Electricity runs through a thin, coiled wire, or filament, in a light bulb. The filament is made of a metal called tungsten, which can reach very high temperatures before it melts. This high melting temperature is a good thing, because when electricity runs through the filament of a light bulb, it reaches a temperature of about 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit, 2,482 degrees Celsius. As the filament becomes white hot, it glows, or becomes incandescent. That glow is the light of an electric bulb. Wires that carry electricity usually allow it to flow through easily. But when wire is very thin like in the filament of a light bulb electrical currents have to force their way through. Causing friction, which causes heat, which, in this case, results in incandescence. Instead of air, light bulbs are filled with a gas called argon. Air has oxygen in it, which all things need to burn. 
if the super hot filament of a light bulb were exposed to air, it would burn out instantly, instead of giving hundreds of hours of light. How do bees make honey? Honeybees collect sweet nectar from flowers and bring it back to their nests or hives. There it is stored for future use, for its sugar provides honeybees with the energy they need. The nectar is stored as honey, which is a thick, concentrated form of nectar that has been converted in the bees' digestive tracts. Honey is stored in many little compartments or cells in the nest, called a hive, which the bees seal over with wax something they also produce. We call this honey-filled wax honeycomb. Beekeepers take honeycomb from the hive, leaving enough behind for the bees. Using the wax for candle making and the honey to sweeten all kinds of foods. What is an allowance? An allowance is an amount of money usually given each week to a child by his or her parents. Kids can use this money to pay for their personal expenses. For things like special snacks, toys, or activities with their friends. In some families, parents do not give their kids allowances. And children just ask their parents when money is needed. But allowances are useful, because they help teach kids how to manage money. Children learn how to control their expenses by staying within their weekly budgets. And children can learn to save if they want to buy something. Expensive by holding on to a portion of their allowances each week. Generally, as children grow older, they become better at handling money, they also have more expenses. So older children usually require larger allowances. In some families, allowances are considered payment for doing household chores. And they increase when children grow older and do more work around the house. What is an only child? An only child is a child who has no brothers or sisters. For a long time, parents and experts on raising children worried that only children would not be as well adjusted in adulthood because they had no brothers or sisters to relate to and share things with as they matured. Some people feared that as adults, only children would be antisocial and selfish. But studies have shown that none of this is true, as only children grow up. They share their lives with young friends and relatives. Lots of only children become well-adjusted adults, and many become high achievers. What is organic farming? While most large farms today use chemicals to control weeds and insects and to produce increased amounts of vegetables. 
milk, or eggs, some farmers have chosen to run their farms without chemicals. Organic farmers believe that the chemicals many farmers use can be damaging to the environment and to the people that eat the food grown on such farms. They feel that natural fertilizers and pest control methods are just as effective and far healthier. A British farmer and scientist named Albert Howard began the practice of organic farming as an alternative to modern chemical-based methods in the 1930s. His ideas have spread all over the world, taking hold in the United States in the late 1940s. A basic principle of organic farming is to focus on keeping the soil rich with nutrients by feeding it natural fertilizers like cow manure. Such fertile soil can help create stronger plants that are better able to resist disease and insects. Organic farmers also prevent insect damage by putting up insect traps or by bringing in beneficial insects that feed on the harmful ones that are causing the problem. In extreme cases, they need to use pesticides, but to continue being certified as Organic farmers in the United States, such farmers need to use botanical pesticides. Those that are made from plants, rather than synthetic, or man-made, chemicals. Organic farmers also try to do more tasks using human power rather than gas-powered vehicles. Thereby using less fuel and cutting down on pollution. Organic farms that raise livestock like dairy cows or chickens feed the animals with natural food. Avoiding chemicals and growth hormones that make cows produce more milk and chickens produce more eggs. Some organic farmers also allow their animals to roam in a large area, such animals are described as free-range. Rather than keeping them in small, climate-controlled pens for their entire lives. While organic farming began in a small way in experimental gardens and small family-run farms it has grown into a huge industry. As more and more people looked for organically grown fruits and vegetables in their grocery stores, more and more companies began producing certified organic foods. At the beginning of the 21st century, organic farming was a $7.70 billion per year. Industry in the United States a small but significant percentage of the entire food selling industry. What is an asteroid? Sometimes described as minor planets, asteroids are rocky objects that orbit around the Sun. Most of them are located in a belt between Mars and Jupiter. Scientists believe there may be more than 50,000 asteroids in that belt and perhaps millions more elsewhere in space. They range in size from nearly 600 miles, 965 kilometers, in diameter to some that are only about 20 feet, 6 meters, across. While 20 feet seem small compared to 600 miles. The smallest asteroids would still have a pretty impressive impact if they hit Earth. Slight changes in asteroids' orbits occasionally cause them to collide with each other. Resulting in small fragments breaking off from the hole. 
Sometimes these small fragments leave their orbit and fall through Earth's atmosphere as meteors. Called meteorites if they hit the planet's surface. Some scientists have suggested that it was a huge asteroids collision with Earth. 65 million years ago that caused the massive damage that led to the extinction of dinosaurs. Why do dogs wag their tails? We usually think that a dog wags its tail to show happiness. But tail wagging in dogs is a little more complicated than that. A dog communicates a lot of information by the movement and position of its tail. If the dog wags its tail while holding it high and stiff, that animal feels threatened and is preparing for a fight. If the tail wags slowly and is held low, the dog is feeling insecure but friendly. But a tail that is held high and swings gracefully back and forth shows that the dog is confident, relaxed, and happy. Even the position of a non-wagging tail has a lot to say. A dog reprimanded for bad behavior often tucks its tail between its legs, showing its distress or fear. Is there anything wrong with thumb sucking? During a child's early years, Thumb sucking is not a problem. In order to survive, all babies are born with sucking reflexes that help them. Feed right away on milk from the mother's breast or formula from a bottle. From the earliest moments. An infant associates sucking with milk filling his or her empty stomach and a feeling of comfort. When not feeding, a baby may frequently suck his or her thumb, fingers, or a pacifier to get that sense of comfort again. The habit often continues in young children when they are bored or frustrated or trying to get to sleep. Many children have a hard time breaking this habit. About 10% of school-age children in the United States 2.4 million suck their thumbs. While thumb sucking doesn't cause problems in very young children who still have their baby teeth. It can have an effect on the bite of older kids who have their permanent teeth. Thumb sucking can push upper teeth forward and lower teeth back so that the top teeth and bottom teeth don't line up the way they should. At this point, children should be strongly encouraged to give up their habit. An older child may want to stop thumb sucking and be more grown up. Especially if he or she feels some pressure from friends at school. But many kids go back to sucking their thumbs when under stress, or when they're sleeping. Keeping thumb sucking children happy and busy, rewarding their efforts to stop. And even using reminders like a piece of tape wrapped around the thumb may help them quit the habit. What do the stars and stripes on the United States flag mean? When the first United States flag was adopted in 1777, it had 13 alternating red and white stripes. 
7 red, 6 white, and, in the upper left portion, 13 white stars on a blue background. The number 13 was chosen because that was the number of original states that formed the United States. For several years after that design was adopted, a new stripe and a new star were added each time a new state joined the Union. But in 1818 Congress decided to keep the number of stripes at 13 and simply add a new star for each new state. The U.S. flag has several nicknames. The Stars and Stripes, the Star Spangled Banner, and Old Glory. At the time the U.S. flag was designed. The Stars and Stripes, and the colors of each, were given no specific meaning. The ideas for the design most likely were based on other countries' flags. In 1782, when the national seal was designed and the flag was incorporated into it, national leaders decided that each color and symbol should have a meaning. As reported in the book Our Flag, published by the U.S. House of Representatives in 1989, it was decided that red symbolized hardiness, strength and valor bravery. White symbolized purity and innocence, and blue represented vigilance, perseverance, and justice. It has also been said that the stars are symbols of the heavens. And the stripes represent rays of light coming from the sun. What is lightning? In a large rain cloud, as water droplets bump into each other and increase in size, they become electrically charged. This activity causes electric charges on the ground, too. Sometimes the charges increase until they become so strong, up to 200 million volts. That electricity runs through the air between the cloud and the ground in the form of a giant spark or lightning bolt. Sometimes, instead of reaching from clouds to the ground, lightning strikes between two electrically charged clouds or within a single cloud. This lightning looks like a sudden glow of light in the sky. Quite different from the jagged streak of light we think of as forked, or bolt, lightning. Why do I have to go to school? So much of what you need to know to live successfully as an adult does not come naturally it has to be learned and studied and memorized. Children learn to speak naturally, for example, by listening to those around them, but reading and writing must be specifically taught. The complicated process of learning the alphabet and the sounds it represents. Putting letter sounds together to make words. And learning the meaning of words in order to read and write are skills that only come with special effort. Knowing how to figure out problems that involve numbers. And learning how the world is run or how nature works are important things to learn, too. Your parents might be able to teach you these things, but they would need many hours each day to do it. Most parents need to work outside the home and wouldn't have the time to give proper instruction. 
though some kids are homeschooled by their parents instead of going to school. In the United States, a public school system provides years of free education for all children. Teachers who are specially trained to know what children should learn. And how, and when are the people who do the job. In past centuries, when most people worked on farms or in simple factory jobs. Formal schooling, that done in a classroom, was not as important. But today, jobs frequently require complicated skills and complex knowledge. To ensure that all children learn the kinds of things that will help them do well as adults. State governments now require that all children to go to school for a certain number of years, usually to the age of 16. So that's another reason you have to go to school it's the law. Kids who skip school a lot find themselves in court. Children who go to private schools or whose parents have received special permission to teach them at home are exceptions. Why do some people lose the hair on their heads? Scientists have been trying to figure out why some people mostly men begin to lose their hair as they grow older. It is believed that a certain hormone Hormones are chemicals that are produced by glands and control different body processes. Causes hair follicles to shrink, and they begin to produce shorter, thinner hairs. The tendency to lose hair or be bald runs in families, meaning that it is an inherited trait. In rare cases, diseases can also cause people to lose their hair. Sometimes hair loss happens as a result of chemotherapy treatments for cancer anti-cancer. Drugs affect some healthy cells as well, including those that cause hair growth. Hair loss due to chemotherapy is reversible. However hair will usually begin growing back once the treatments are over. What's the difference between a continent and a country? A continent is a land mass that is generally except in the cases of Australia and Antarctica, home to a number of countries. Continental boundaries are determined by geography rather than politics. Canada and the United States, for example, are part of the North American continent. Because they occupy the same land mass, not because they share a political system. A country, on the other hand, is a defined territory that governs itself and is recognized by the international community. A country's citizens live under the rule of their government and according to the nation's laws. What is the longest river in the world? The longest river in the world is the Nile River located in Africa. From its source in the country of Burundi to its mouth on the Mediterranean Sea. It extends for 4,145 miles, 6,670 kilometers. 
but the world's second longest river, the Amazon, 4,007 miles, or 6,451 kilometers. Which is located in South America, is really the world's biggest river. It has more than 1,000 tributaries, or branches, and carries far more water than the Nile. Why do rhinoceroses often have birds riding on their backs? The small birds seen on the huge backs of rhinos giant horned. Animals that come from Africa and Southern Asia are called tick birds. These birds feed on the parasites or bugs hidden in the thick. Deeply folded skin of the large animals, keeping them clean and healthy. The cries of tick birds also warn rhinos when danger is approaching. Such warnings are helpful because rhinos have very bad eyesight.